the Kill Count, where we tally up the victims in all our favorite horror movies. I'm James A. Janice, and today we're looking at Hereditary, released in 2018. Hereditary is the feature film debut of writer-director Ari Aster, and it, along with his sophomore effort, Midsummer slash Midsommar, shows that the dude is real good at exploring grief. Just blinding, gut-wrenching grief. Seriously, his characters go through some shit. Hereditary is a horror film that spends most of its time being a family drama. Aster calls the film a tragedy that curdles into a nightmare. It follows a miniatures artist, played by Tony Collette, who was previously seen on The Kill Count as the mom and Krampus. Collette gives the performance of a lifetime here, and just like with the guys in the lighthouse, it's fucking laughable that she wasn't even nominated for an Oscar. It's her emotional wreckage that gives the film so much weight and left me feeling tense for two hours straight when I saw it in theaters. This is one I've gotta recommend you watch on your own first, as long as you can handle sadness, cause I'ma have to cut short most of its exquisitely crafted anguish for the kill count. This ain't a tear count, you know? Hereditary was also one of the scariest first time viewings I've experienced as an adult. And although I know plenty of people were turned off by the film's ending, its over the top head first dive into horror really worked for me. After two hours of slow creepy build up, I'd say Hereditary is one of my three favorite horror films from 2018, alongside Mandy and Annihilation if you're willing to count it. I once said on our podcast episode for this movie that I would never cover it on a kill count because it was too sad. Well, fuck past James. Let's get to the kills! The movie begins with an obituary. Ellen, mother of Annie, has passed away. Shame. You can tell just by looking at her that that lady was a saucy one. Annie, daughter of Ellen, delivers a detached eulogy to a bunch of unfamiliar people. It's heartening to see so many strange new faces here today. Surprised that her very private mother has attracted such a crowd. Maybe they just loved her sense of style, Annie. Yeah, see? Check that dude out. Total necklace guy, written all over him. Annie Graham is a miniature maker who copes by incorporating the loss of her mother into her work. Her profession as a miniaturist also lends itself to an amazing first shot of the film, one that seamlessly transitions from the miniatures in her workshop to a full-sized set inside of her son Peter's room. Peter is Annie Annie's oldest child, and the night after the funeral, he assures his dad Steve, a psychiatrist, that he feels fine. A little sad? Mm. Okay, I get it. They're not the only ones feeling that way either. Should I be sadder? As for Annie and Steve's other child, Charlie, well, she's doing her own thing, making creative little trash figures and sleeping in their cold treehouse, cause she YOLO like that. That's how you get pneumonia. That's okay. Charlie is played by then 14-year-old Millie Shapiro, who won an honorary Tony for playing Matilda when she was 10. Not only does she give an unforgettable performance in this movie, but she's also a big horror movie fan. I've always wanted to be in a horror movie, because I love watching horror movies. Charlie was apparently her grandma Ellen's favorite, even getting breastfed by her gram-gram instead of Annie, though she wasn't entirely perfect in her grandma's eyes. She wanted me to be a boy. Hmm, did she also want you to be more Satan-y? Or wait, say Tony? Who's Tony? Tony's a little boy that loves my mom. Ha, <laughs> that's right. Thanks, Doc. In a box of her mom's stuff, Annie finds a book about spiritualism with a note inside addressed to her, talking about sacrifice and rewards. Love, Mommy. Don't you miss Mommy, Annie? Don't you wish Mommy were here right now? Hmm, actually, no, that's fucking terrifying. Wanna do something about that, Ann? Thank you. Not today, say Tony. At school, the grandchildren aren't the best students. Charlie is always making crafts and uh, cutting heads off of birds and um, getting waved at by strange ladies. Okay. And Peter, well, fucking stone ass Peter, just be looking at butts all day. Or maybe he's just jealous that she has pants to wear, having spent so much time in a naked band. Annie secretly goes to a grief therapy group, hoping to find a way to be a Little Miss Sunshine. She reluctantly opens up and gives us a bunch of backstory about her and her mom, who were estranged for a long time until near the end of Ellen's life. Ellen suffered from dementia, which was made worse by her dissociative identity disorder. Her psychological issues seemed to run in the family, in a word, they were hereditary, since Annie's older brother had schizophrenia and hanged himself when he was 16. And of course he suicide note blamed her, accusing her of putting people inside him. Peter's token up in his room, not noticing that someone's in the treehouse behind him, him, breathing and watching him, when he gets a text about a party. Bring a dick! 
He asks his mom if he can go, but since he frames it as a school barbecue thing, he gets roped into taking his younger sister too. But mom, Charlie's had such a long day already, making her dead bird thing and doing her signature clucking noise. By the way, if you were one of those douchebags who clucked through the movie in theaters, fuck you! Charlie's also been seeing Shimmers of Light and arsonist dead grandmas in fields, so yeah, like I said, long day. At Annie's insistence, Peter's forced to bring Charlie along so she can socialize, and he's just super thrilled about that. Seriously, so good. Big brother go. It's okay, Peter. You're almost there. The party's just past this pole. Wait, yo, it's Grandma Ellen's necklace design. Was Grandma an electrician? They get to the party, and while Peter, as instructed, brought his dick, looks like other people have brought the nuts. Oh, yeah, in an earlier scene, we saw that Charlie has a nut allergy. Does that have nuts? Because we don't have the EpiPen. I don't know why I bring that up, though. I'm sure it's not important. Peter immediately hits up that chick with the butt and has a slightly awkward interaction with her. How's the party? Why, you want to know if you should come? <laughs> Bet he wishes he were Smolder Bravestone right now. He finds an inn with a bag of weed, and they head to a room to smoke it together. Not you though, Charlie. Go get some of that cake or something. I hear the taste is insane. Just like, totally nuts. The nuts do a number on Charlie's immune system, and she asks for help from Peter, who, in a dreadful bit of timing, just got super fucking high. It's hard to Breathe. Wow, that is a nightmare. He takes her to the car and drives as fast as he can to get her to a hospital. Anaphylactic and unable to breathe, Charlie sticks her head out of the window for air right as Peter sees a deer in the road. He swerves to avoid it, a fatal mistake. <laughs> Holy shit. Peter, dude. Holy shit, dude. Yo, that's fucked, man. Charlie has been decapitated, her headless corpse still in the backseat of the car. And if you want to see the head, well, okay, I'll show it to you, just because the movie does the next day. There it is. Fucked up, right? Past James might have had a point. I really hope for your sake that you weren't spoiled before you saw that happen. There aren't a lot of movie moments that absolutely break me the way that that one did. If it makes you feel any better, though, Millie Shapiro says she had a great time hanging out the car window in a harness as it drove 30 miles per hour. Kinda felt like a roller coaster, and I love roller coasters. She also wanted to keep her fake severed head, but I don't think she got to in the end. Sorry, Millie. Completely in shock, Peter numbly puts the car in drive and returns home. There, he goes straight into his room to go to sleep. And the next morning, he lies there awake, listening to his mom as she leaves to go get some balsa wood. So, uh, you still gonna get that balsa wood, or...? Once again, as I mentioned in the intro, this movie is like 90% well-acted anguish. I just wanna die! But that's something you're gonna have to go watch on your own. I'm doing my jokey recap kill count thing here. The family's second funeral in a week has left all of them empty bags of grief. Steve reminisces about Charlie through her artwork, Annie sleeps alone in the treehouse at night, and Peter relives the moment constantly, even while sitting in class. Annie considers another therapy session, but decides against going inside at the last minute. On her way out of the parking lot, she's flagged down by a woman named Joan, who commiserates with Annie on a personal Personal level. My son died. Joan says her son and seven-year-old grandson died together in a drowning, so she knows how Annie must be feeling. She washes over her with a wave of love and sympathy and gives Annie her phone number in case she ever needs to talk. Aw, it's so nice when you're able to make new friends as an adult. I'm really happy for you, Annie. That night, she sleeps in the treehouse again, the red glow of the heaters reflecting in Peter's eyes as he lies in bed. What the fuck? Was that a cluck? Oh man, this movie's got simple sound effects and empty corners seeming piss your pants scary. Annie goes to see Joan the next day, finding a very peculiar doormat outside her apartment. My mother used to embroider ones just like that. Did she really? Isn't that funny? Yes, it is funny. Annie spills her misery for a while, and when the subject of Peter comes up, she recalls a time when she woke up from a sleepwalking spell and found herself standing next to him and Charlie. All three of them soaked in paint thinner, and her about to strike a match. Holy shit! And it was impossible to convince them that it was just sleepwalking. Which, of course it was. Unsurprisingly, that permanently scarred their relationship. And I can't say that Annie's latest miniature would help at all. It's not about him. Oh no? No, 
know, it's a neutral view of the accident. Yeah, I'm still pretty fucked up now. The family has a dinner that becomes one of the film's most devastating scenes. And we're talking about a movie where a little girl got her head knocked off. Ari Aster has called it the centerpiece of the film, as it's the full-scale eruption of all the familial tension that's been building. It's very uncomfortable to watch, mostly because the argument between Annie and Peter is so vicious and real. Your sister is dead, but you can't take responsibility for anything! Once again, career-defining performance by Tony Collette. I find it hilarious that Collette was only looking to do lighthearted comedies when her agent gave her this script. Though it wasn't what she was looking for, the script was too good to turn down. On the subject of acting, the 19-year-old Alex Wolf absolutely kills it, and I've also got to bring some attention to Gabriel Byrne. It's easy to overlook his performance, since Steve is such a quiet, measured character, but he serves as a great grounding. It's the pitch-perfect cast that makes this movie so effective. Horror films are much more upsetting and frightening if you are invested in the characters. While leaving a craft store, hopefully finally getting that balsa wood, and he runs into Joan in the parking lot, acting all kinds of effervescent. And Dowd is totally great too, especially with this cloying performance that contrasts with her work in The Leftovers and The Handmaid's Tale. Joan tells Annie that she's jumping for joy because she went to a seance where a medium connected her to her late grandson. An unsure Annie joins Joan at her apartment, where she reaches out to her grandson Louie. Sure enough, Annie feels his presence like a sixth sense. He's all around them! <gasps> Hi, Louie. Little Louie moves cups, plays with hair, and writes messages on chalkboards. I love you, Grandma. Oh, Louie! I love you, sweetheart. But this is all too much for Annie, who throws up the X and calls it. On her way out, Joan gives her instructions so she can talk with Charlie. Read this out loud, every syllable, very carefully. It's to make things start. Annie doesn't want to try it, but an experience on the way home makes her decision and seals her fate. <laughs> That night, Annie is in bed when she realizes they've got ants. Come on now, did someone leave cake crumbs out? Or possibly a dead Peter? That'll get you ants too, you know. Oh, and those are fire ants? No wonder Annie looks so scared. Mom, what are you doing? Oh, nothing. Just sleepwalking and talking real shit. I never wanted to be your mother. Oh, too real. Shit. Annie even mouth vomits that she tried to have a miscarriage while pregnant, but promises that she's happy it didn't work and she loves him. Even though he's now covered in paint thinner again, and so is she, and there's the match, and whoo, just a dream. Still pretty fucked up, though. Annie wakes Peter up for realsies, so he and Steve can join her downstairs. And now's as good a time as any to mention their awesome frickin' house. The exterior of the Graham house was shot in Utah during a very green spring, but the interiors of the house were all built from scratch as part of an intricate set on a soundstage. Ari Aster, who likes to avoid run-of-the-mill coverage, spent six months planning out every single shot of the film's 156 scenes, before spending another three weeks refining them all alongside production designer Grace Yoon and cinematographer Pavel Pogorzelski. They used wide shots in these large spaces to make the Grams look like figures in one of Annie's dioramas. It takes some coaxing, but Annie gets Peter and Steve around a table and asks them to join her for a seance. All right, I'll stay. <laughs> that line delivery and camera pan is so Wes Anderson to me. Steve's way more skeptical, but Annie takes their hands and, using Charlie's notebook as a spiritual connection, calls out to her late daughter. Peter feels the air, quote, flexing, and then all of them watch as a glass moves on its own. The guys get freaked out, Peter barely able to breathe, and after a quick pyro entrance, there's a spirit in the house. Hello? Mom? Mom? Aw, oh, man, you're being real scary, Annie. Why are you scaring me? Lady, you're scaring us! Now knock it off! <laughs> The classics always work. At school, Peter sees that shimmering ring of light and a reflection of himself smirking like a little shit. He calls his dad and says a vengeful spirit is after him. And when Steve reports what happened to Annie, they get into an argument that leaves her so angry she starts smashing apart her school for ants. Kind of painful to watch her destroy all these incredible miniatures made by Toronto-based effects artist Steve Newburn. Newburn was originally contracted to just make the movie's prosthetics, like the various disturbing 
disturbing versions of Charlie's severed head. After reading the script, Newburn asked Ari Aster if he could also make the miniatures, a crucial part to the film since they kind of represent how powerless the Graham family is, with outside forces controlling them like dolls in a dollhouse. Newburn led a small team that spent 10 weeks creating thousands of 1 to 12 scale miniatures of places and things. It worked hand in hand with production designer Grace Yoon to make sure everything matched the full sized sets. The carpet, the wallpaper, everything. Some of the miniatures were handcrafted of wood and others were 3D printed, while others still were built specifically to be destroyed here. As for seeing his work demolished, Newburn was pretty chill about it. They were all built to be smashed. Kind of run of the mill for the miniature side of things. Most of the time when you're building a miniature, it's for the purpose of it being blown up or smashed or destroyed in some some respect. It's, it's actually the thing you kind of look forward to. While Annie's reached the point of professional self-destruction, Peter's emotional breakdown is manifesting itself in different ways. Ways that involve seeing Charlie in his room. But look on the bright side, dude. At least you're seeing her with a head still attached. <sighs> Just can't fucking win, huh, man? Peter is suddenly grabbed at the top of his head and held against his bed. And was that done by Annie sleepwalking again? Or did she really just run in when she heard him screaming like she says? Shit's getting way too weird here. And when Charlie's notebook fills up with drawings of Peter, X'd out and scared, Annie decides to burn the book and sever the spiritual connection. When she tries, though, her arm becomes a flame just like the book. And the fire doesn't die down until she's fully stamped it out. The next day, she heads back to Joan's apartment, but her friend isn't inside. What is inside is that symbol from Ellen's necklace, a bunch of candles, some of Charlie's creations, and some pictures of Peter. Another gander at the doormat spurs Annie to look through her mom's stuff again, and she finds a book talking about King Payman, a demon who will possess the most vulnerable host he can find after being invoked. Especially if the host is a dude. Payman loved the dudes. Ari Aster wanted to avoid using boring old Lucifer, so he did some pagan research and settled on King Payment, Lucifer's right-hand man who's been mentioned in literature dating back to the 17th century. Payment is a camel-riding demon servant who promises wealth in exchange for offerings, rich rewards like what Annie's reading about right now. She also finds in her mother's scrapbook a whole bunch of pictures of Joni, cause she's a phony! She knew Grandma Ellen and was so close to her, she even helped give her golden showers. And now she's stalking Annie's kid! I expel you! What? Bell, wait, are you the new principal? Joan tells Peter to get out of his body, which is not the kind of shit you want to hear when you're already dealing with shimmering rings all over the place. And he decides to head into the attic, where the number of flies would put the Amityville house to shame. The flies are buzzing around because Ellen's body is up here, with that symbol on the wall above her, the seal of payment. And I know she died before the film started, but we've gotten to know her more since then, so I'll put her on the list now, as Annie discovers her body recently dug up from its grave. Peter keeps hearing clucks in class, and they affect him so much, he becomes a mother clucka himself. Then he starts banging his head against the desk, and man, it's real messed up. <laughs> Yeah, ain't no one in that class forgetting this. Alex Wolf went method for this role, keeping himself in character for pretty much the entire duration of the shoot. He didn't even introduce himself as Alex to the crew until the final day of shooting. He actually bloodied himself against the desk in this scene, even though the top of it was made of protective foam. Wolf went through so much for this role that he ended up going to therapy after he rapped, and he's compared the toll of the experience to boxing, which I guess he did when he was younger. Intense guy. Peter is picked up from school by Steve, who can't even keep it together anymore. And after he gets Peter back home, the last thing he wants to hear is that there's a body in the attic. I, mean, I think it's my mother, I think, but I can't tell because the skin's all black and she's all distended, but the head is gone. Though he's skeptical, Steve follows the flies and discovers off screen that Ellen's body is up there. But he doesn't listen to Annie as she explains the whole phony Joni thing. He thinks Annie went and dug up her mom's body. Instead of this family inheriting a curse, psychiatrist Steve thinks there's a more usual suspect to blame. Namely, that Annie has inherited her mom's dissociative identity disorder. After all, she does suffer from sleepwalking fugues and seemed pretty dissociated during the seance. Hello? Mom? Mom? Annie wants Steve to burn the notebook, even though it may immolate her, because she just wants to end this and save her family. But Steve refuses. I'm not gonna do this with you anymore. What? No, no, no. 
no, it's not helpful. She tries to burn the book herself again, but this time Steve goes up in flames and burns like he was losing the cooking round in an academic decathlon. Annie is shocked at the sight of it until she absorbs the shimmering light and instantly becomes blank faced. Another iconic shot that Tony Collette nailed in a single take. Day ends, night comes, and there are a bunch of Nanky people around. Don't miss them! Peter wakes up to a very quiet house, though some light is coming from the treehouse. As far as the house house though, not a single sign of Wait, what the fuck? Yo, no! How long she been up there? Yo, Peter, check it out! Look behind- Oh, nope, you missed it. That airwalk was nasty too. He comes downstairs where he finds the burnt body of his dad next to the fireplace. Who could have done that? You think maybe the scary lady hanging out on the ceiling? Or maybe it was that smiley guy from the funeral, now standing in the doorway, naked as the day he was born. And looking damn mighty proud of it too. Annie emerges from a corner and chases Peter upstairs, where he climbs into the attic and hides. Should be safe up there, dude. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Wait, did she get a ladder or? This movie is so fucking freaky, I love it! The banging stops and Peter looks around the fly-infested attic, though he doesn't see his grandma's body since it's gone now. In its place, a picture of Peter with his eyes punched out. Then he hears a noise coming from somewhere above him. What is that wet kind of Oh, it's Annie, just hanging out, sawing at her neck with piano wire. With more prosthetics made by Steve Newburn. Apparently none of this film's effects were digital. The terrifying sight of Annie and the wire saw is only outweirded by a trio of Nakes waving at Peter. It causes him to flee through the attic window, right as the sound effect tells us that Annie's all done sawing. A headless shadow floats over and past Peter, whose body is then visited by that ring of shimmering light. This is the soul of payment, which took over Annie after Steve died and caused her to be the creepy ceiling skater lady. With her head removed, payment's soul could once again leave and find a new host, and now it has. I won't count Peter as dead, because, like, maybe his soul is still in there somewhere? Though he's definitely not the one driving as he approaches the glowing treehouse, passing by smiling naked people as he does. Once inside, he finds more nakies kneeling, and a big old King Payment statue with Charlie's head wearing a crown. Oh, and also the headless bodies of his mom and grandmother. Joan arises amidst these followers of Queen Lee and places a crown atop Peter's head. Only, it's not really Peter. Charlie, you're all right now. Wait, Charlie? I thought that was Payman. You are Payman, one of the eight kings of hell. Oh, so it's Charlie and Payman in Peter's body. Yeah, I, I get it. T totally. Joan tells the Charlie Peter Payman man that they're forever in his service, and the movie ends with some Rosemary's Baby like chanting. That's the end of the movie, but in case you needed some kind of wrap-up explanation, here you go. Annie's mom Ellen, alias Queen Lee, had always been involved with a naked cult that worshipped King Payment. They wanted to give him a human body, which needed to be part of Ellen's bloodline, thus the title Hereditary, so Ellen first attempted to use her son, Annie's brother. That didn't work out so well. And of course his suicide note blamed her, accusing her of putting people inside him. By the time Peter was born, Annie and Ellen were estranged, so she was wasn't able to get to him. When Annie had Charlie, she offered an olive branch and allowed Ellen to have a very close relationship with her granddaughter. Even when you're a little baby, she wouldn't let me feed you because she needed to feed you. From the moment she was born, Charlie's body has been used by Ellen as a payment incubator. A payment incubator, if you will. In fact, the clucking is a sign of payment's presence. A payment indicator. But Charlie's body was never meant to be Payman's forever home, since he has a preference for male housing. She wanted me to be a boy. The cult wrote magic words around the house, and, as indicated by the seal of Payman on the head-severing utility pole, also had some influence in Charlie getting killed. The decapitation, specifically, may have allowed Payman's spirit to shimmer around more freely, it being the ring of light seen throughout the movie. I, uh, think. At least that's my Payman interpretation. When Joan gave Annie seance instructions to speak to Charlie, it was actually a set of words to activate Payman. 
It's to make things start. That was his demonic ass moving cups around tables, not the spirits of dead kids. After that, things got rough for Peter, because as noted in Ellen's book, the male body meant to house payment had to be broken down before the moving process could begin. Payment killed Steve and possessed Annie to make her all scary, and also eventually kill herself, which left Peter broken down enough for payment to enter his body. Though the demon may still think of itself as Charlie, having inhabited her body for so long. That's why Joan had to calm him down in that final scene. Hope that helps. No, no, it's not helpful. How many people were left hereditary and hereditary? <laughs> Let's find out and get to the numbers. Only four people died in Hereditary, but that didn't make it any less scary. The victims were three headless females and one male Steve, a mostly cherry pie chart there, and with a runtime of 127 minutes, that left us with a kill on average every 31.75 minutes. I'll give the golden chainsaw for coolest kill, honestly, to Charlie, even though it was a real dark moment. Her death was completely shocking and instantly became an iconic moment in horror history. You gotta honor that, you know? Dull machete for lamest kill will go to Ellen, the saucy Satan. And that's it. Hereditary came out in 2018, got amazing reviews, and then got some backlash because that's what happens when you get amazing reviews. I still think it's fucking great. Your long wait is over, because on Tuesday, I'm starting Stranger Things 2. But until then, I'm James A. Janice. This has been The Kill Count. Thanks a lot for watching this Kill Count. I want to thank some patrons like Mariah Zamora, Grayson Starkey, Amy, Christopher Tucker, C. Hofe, and Aaron Scheidler. Hey, real quick shout out to Scream Magazine, who sent me a couple of their issues to read. It's filled with really cool interviews and behind the scenes information on both modern and classic horror movies. It's an awesome 100 page supplement to any horror movie fan's knowledge. Check them out, link in the description below. Thanks everyone, be good people.